All right, folks, um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name's Fee and welcome to History Acts 26. Um, our workshop tonight is called Homes Not Borders. Um, we've still got lots of people coming into the chat, but I was just gonna start with um, some housekeeping for tonight. Um, so first of all, the format of uh, History Acts events, if you've not been to one before, you're very welcome. Uh, history Acts is a radical history forum and we try to connect activists with historians with a real emphasis on trying to make history and historical research really useful for folks doing community campaigning and organizing social movements in the present. Um, and because of that, the format of our workshops is um, quite activist centered. So what we'll do tonight, as in all of our other sessions, is we'll start with a uh, short contributions and introductions for about 10 minutes from each of our activists um, and then we'll have uh, two historians who will share um, some conversational reflections on what the activist presentations have brought up for them in, in relation to their historical research um, and then uh, a big part of um, the second hour and so the big part of our workshop tonight will be given over to discussion from everyone in the audience um, and between the panel about things that have been brought up today about the intersection of uh, housing movements and migrant justice movements um, and how resistance against deportations and resistance against evictions has worked historically um, and the challenges and opportunities for it today as well. Um, and so for some housekeeping, just to let you know that like with all of our History Acts events, um, this workshop is being recorded. Um, and that recording will be shared on our website, uh, www.historyacts.org. Um, and the events are also written up um, and documented in that way, and those are made um, available to everyone. Um, so do feel free to turn your video off or change your name, whatever works for you, but this event is being recorded um, and it's also being uh, streamed live on YouTube for folks who are unable to, to join the call because there's lots of us tonight. Um, we'll be using Twitter throughout. We've got um, Stefan will be live tweeting the event. So do join the conversation and use the, um, the hashtag, hashtag History Acts. Um, and last one is just in terms of being on this Zoom call, do try and keep yourself muted. Um, we will be using the chat box mainly for um, sharing links to resources as they come up in conversation between the panelists. Um, and if you do have um, questions, which we'd really uh, encourage and welcome uh, for the second half of the session, please send those directly to me, that's V Amos, um, and not to everyone in the chat box. Um, and so, yeah, just a little bit about today's workshop. Um, today's workshop's called Homes Not Borders. Um, and today's session is really about trying to celebrate and also map um, the various intersecting uh, struggles for against housing insecurity um, and against um, migrant injustice or against, and in the fight for immigration controls and other forms of state racism. Um, so we recognize there's a huge amount of mobilization going on at the moment in the UK. Um, and this is about trying to connect the dots between those different kinds of campaigning. Um, and also look at them in their longer histories and also kind of understand from activist points of view what's the historical development of those conditions in which people are struggling against today as well. So these, all of these things like feel very pertinent at the moment. There's a lot going on the last week, the last, last few months, especially in the context of the pandemic, but also in the, you know, the longer history of um, the kind of destruction of welfare um, within the UK, within the last 15 years, within the last 40 years and how those have interacted with other forms of state racism and immigration controls. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to uh, Benjamin Morgan, who's from the Public Interest Law Center. Um, Benjamin and Public Interest Law Center are leaving, leading the legal challenge that's being mounted at the moment um, against the new immigration rule, which is gonna be making uh, rough sleeping itself into grounds for deportation or removal as the Home Office calls it. So I'm going to pass over to Benjamin just now. Thanks, Fee. Hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to say a bit about um, what the Home Office is doing 
um, about the new the new rough sleeping rule. Um, and I also had some sort of dis disconnected reflections about other things that hopefully are um, in line with with the theme. Um, maybe I'll save some of those for the Q and A and just concentrate for now on 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 saying a bit about about what's going on with with um, with the new the new rough sleeping rule. I, I suppose one thing to start off by saying might be that I feel a bit of an imposter being being represented as a as as an activist in 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 this workshop, even though my background is in in housing campaigns and in 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 migrants' rights campaigns as well. Um, I work for a law center now, um, which is also a charity and an NGO. and I, I think perhaps maybe one of the things it might be interesting for us to talk about later is um we've got activists on on the one on the one side and um academics on the other where do um where do ngos and where do lawyers fit into the picture in terms of um struggles for for migrant and, and housing justice i think that might be something to something to reflect on um in terms of what I wanted to talk about, um, in in October last year, the Home Office published a statement of changes to to the UK's immigration rules to um, to accompany the the immigration bill that was making its way through Parliament at the time. Um, and together, the the immigration rules and the and the immigration act, which is which has now now gone through, created um, a new immigration system for the UK, um, it, which ended free movement for EU citizens, um, and instituted a new points based visa regime. Um, effectively, the new system reflects the government's commitment to border policies that. That are going to entrench the the extractive and um, the extractive dynamics of, of the contemporary racial capitalism. Um, that's that's how you know what I see that immigration act and these immigration rules is doing. Um, the aspect of the of the new immigration rules or the changes to the immigration rules that I wanted to focus on in um, now is is the decision to to make rough sleeping um, a ground on which a person can have their permission to, to stay in the UK refused or cancelled. Um, and I'll, I'll, say, I'll say a bit about that, that rule. Um, first of all, it's, it's worth saying that um, there's a long history to, to this kind of policy or a relatively long history in, in kind of contemporary terms. Um, in, in, May in May 2016, a month before the Brexit referendum, the Home Office um, introduced a policy that, that said that rough sleeping was an abuse of EU freedom of movement rights. Um, and this policy empowered immigration officers to administratively remove effectively to deport um, street homeless EU citizens from the UK. Um, and that policy was aimed at, at migrants from, quite explicitly aimed at migrants from Central, Eastern and Southern Europe, um, uh, groups which had experienced quite high rates of street homelessness um, over the past decade, um, particularly in London and, and, and the Southeast of England, and, and continue to do so actually. Um, one interesting thing or kind of useful thing maybe to note about that that policy which which led to the deportation of um an unknown number but certainly thousands of homeless europeans from the uk um and which you know which we took the government to court over um one thing to say about that policy is that even though it was a home office policy it evolved out of local government policy it was it was 
it was a social policy aimed at being a solution to homelessness before it was a hostile environment policy and that might be something that's kind of it's something which often gets missed when people talk about talk about that policy and i think it's an interesting thing to 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 think about it, it was it was the greater london authority and westminster council um who who were the 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 orchestrators of that policy not not the home office in the first instance um that policy um saying that that being street homeless was an abuse of your of your freedom of movement rights as, a, as an eu citizen was ruled unlawful in the high court in 2017 um that was after a judicial review challenge brought by by the by pilk the organization i work for on behalf of um three homeless eu citizens who'd, who'd either been detained or or removed through the policy um there was also a big um a big campaign um led by northeast london migrant action nelma which i was a part of at the time um one thing to say maybe about the the fight against this this new rough sleeping rule which was introduced um towards the end of last year um is that we're, we're taking the government to court again um but we don't have a kind of an activist vehicle for that it's just lawyers doing it at the moment or lawyers and and, and people like me i'm not a lawyer um but i work for a law center um and it, it you know one of the things we could we could think about together is is you know what what the the what have it what it what the campaign against removals having an activist dimension in 2017 meant um and brought that we don't have that we don't have now when we're when we're fighting this um mainly through the courts um just just to say a bit about the new rule um it says that if you effectively says that if you sleep rough as a non-UK national, you could have your permission to be in the UK refused um, if you're applying for permission, or you could have your your visa cancelled if you already have one. Um, it won't apply. It won't apply to everybody. Um, it's worth worth pointing out there are certain categories of um, migrant non-UK national who are exempt. Um, in terms of who the government's trying to get with this this rule it seems to be the same people principally that they were trying to get in 2017 and and in the kind of decade before that um which is to say eu citizens who um who don't sort themselves out through the settled status scheme um which was introduced to 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 help people to help people settle in the uk um if they were from europe after brexit they're trying to target EU citizens who don't sort themselves out before the deadline or new arrivals from the EU after after June this year um but other migrants could be affected as well i mean there's there's a quite a broad number of categories of migrant who could be affected and again we can we can talk about that um i'll stop now because i've i've gone on but um maybe one thing to a point to end on is is just the 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 point that regardless of of how these of how this new rule is implemented and we're not sure how it will be implemented and regardless of who ends up being affected by it um the very fact that it exists is is going to make it much harder for non-uk national rough sleepers to to get the help they need um if if the stated aim of the policy was to was to reduce rough sleeping among 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 non UK nationals, it's likely to have the opposite effect. And I'll stop there. Um, thanks, Benjamin. That was um, really really informative and really interesting. Um, it also points out something that I was going to bring up in the introduction as well. Um, it's not going to be covered by any of the panelists that we have today, but it might come up in conversation, which is about there's also uh, in the last few weeks um, new plans from the Home Office to make uh, trespass and unauthorised encampments uh, a criminal offence and to give the police more, uh, much broader uh, eviction powers 
as well. So we'll be thinking about how that's going to affect um, over policed, over racialized um, gypsy and traveler communities, as well as like rising populations of people forced to sleep rough in a, in a separate way as well. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass over to the to Savan and um, Joel from the No Evictions Network based in Glasgow. Uh, no Evictions Network started in summer 2018 to organise neighbourhoods in Glasgow against the mass eviction of asylum seekers from Circo run accommodation across the city. The campaign culminated in Circo losing their contract in Scotland, but being replaced by a new company, Mayors. Throughout the lockdown this year, the network supported people evicted from asylum accommodation and rehoused or detained in hotels, while also campaigning against the horrendous conditions that people are facing. So I'll pass over to Savan and Joel. Thanks, V. <clears throat> Thanks so much, everybody. It's really great to be here. Um, cheers to everyone who's helping organise and facilitate and do all the tech and everything. And yeah, thanks, Benjamin. That was really informative and great to get our head around. Um, it's definitely been on a lot of people's minds up here, I think, just like as often is the way these sort of bits of news trickle around and cause a lot of fear and anxiety and stress. Um, just before I forget, actually, you made me think there's something me and Fee have been talk talking about, which I think we should come to in the discussions. It's just in a general way. I think what we're all talking about in some sense is kind of partly how the Home Office is managed, how the Home Office manages to shift what counts as kind of adequate accommodation and use homelessness as a as a kind of punishment and a, the threat of it as a way of keeping people um, in line. And I think that that's something that's been on a lot of people's minds up here. And I think a lot of the fear around this rough sleeping, even though it seems unlikely that it'll kind of apply to people in the asylum system is about the kind of long-term impacts of changing those kind of definitions of adequate accommodation in some sense. And then whether we could end up in a situation where, you know, the rules about uh, accessing asylum accommodation are all about proving that you currently don't have adequate accommodation. So you could have this horrible kind of catch 22 where you can't, you know, you, you could be punished for being homeless and then you can't prove that you need accommodation because you could get punished for that. So anyway, I think that's on a lot of people's minds, even if that, they're not the immediate targets. Um, but yeah, to, to talk about no evictions, me and Savannah are going to just kind of as quickly as we can really explain a bit about the campaign. I'm going to talk a bit about the history of it and then Savannah's going to talk more about uh, what we've been doing recently with the hotels and, and kind of the long, the sort of wider impact really of, of all this stuff. Um, so yeah, thanks Fee. I mean, basically just to add to what Fee said with the history of No Evictions Network, <clears throat> it started in summer 2018. Um, there was a lot of different groups and individuals who came together. Um, I think it's fair to say that the kind of free kind of formative groups were uh, Living Rent, which is a tenants union, um, Unity Centre, which is a drop-in centre for people in the asylum immigration system. That's why I volunteered for years, so that's kind of how I get, got involved. And a newer group called MORE, Migrants Organising for Rights and Empowerment, um, who've been doing loads of amazing work around everything from education, access to um, like a, a bike club and lots of direct support stuff um, and kind of fully migrant run. Um, initially, there was a huge kind of outcry, people might remember, in the news when Circle, who ran asylum accommodation in Glasgow, announced that they were going to evict 300 people who lived in that accommodation. Um, and there was a lot of kind of big protests in the city, uh, around the city, called by all kinds of groups. And we kind of came out of that a bit and tried to focus some of the actions specifically on Circo and the Home Office and their kind of offices in the city. So we did some quite big kind of surround Circo offices, direct action type stuff. <clears throat> we presented them with a notice to quit the city. Uh, which was what they were handing out to everybody else, uh, to all these people um, in the system. And actually, I guess in some sort of strange way, we had a win there because as Fee mentioned, Circle did lose that contract. And it's a small win because they continue to run other parts of the contract in the rest of the country. But I think we have to kind of chalk them up a bit when we can. And I think it wasn't just down to us, but there's definitely something there that we can kind of think about and build on. Um, so I guess <clears throat> in the background of all that really, um, there was a legal challenge going on, which I think it's useful to just quickly try and frame. I'll do my best to do that. I managed to go with people from the from the network to, to, to watch the trial at the Court of Sessions in Edinburgh, which happened in February 2019, after Govan Law Centre lodged, uh, lodged the case uh, with a couple of people who were facing the eviction. So, um, yeah, basically it was, it was really interesting. The way that Govan Law kind of situated the argument against Circle and the Home Office was for Govan Law Centre, these people were tenants. They, were, uh, they should have all the rights of a tenancy and should be treated with the same uh, respect and rights as anyone else. Uh, this was a lease that they had to live in these, in these properties. 
and Circle were operating in a sense as a kind of quasi-public body because they were doing something the Home Office or the local government used to do. Um, but interestingly, they also said that there was something sort of coercive about it because people didn't have a choice if they could leave or not. Um, and then for Circle, they were saying, oh, no, this, these are just occupants. It's a temporary occupancy agreement. Um, they, they made analogies to homeless and shelters. And they said it's that we're just a private company doing what we're told. And there's no coercion. That's silly. This is just compulsion. So there was these kind of weird terminological debates, which I think is interesting to hear about, would be interesting to hear about from the, the historians too, in terms of how these things get framed. Um, in the end, Lord Tyre, who made the initial sort of decision, um, basically sided with the Home Office and Circle on the most important points, which was um, they, that Circle could carry out what it wanted to do, which was a lock change eviction. So they could change someone's locks where they're out of the property um, and they, they wouldn't be able to get back in. I very sadly witnessed a couple of these happen, but luckily we managed to stop quite a lot of them as a network. Um, but you can imagine the horror of returning home. I mean, was one guy I knew who had been to a doctor's appointment, was very ill. Uh, and came home and could see the pile of sawdust from the old key through his letterbox, but couldn't get back in to get his medicine. Um, Circo as ever unavailable to help um, when we tried to call them. So there's, those kind of things did happen, but the vast majority of those 300 people didn't get evicted. And I think that's partly from the kind of grassroots organizing that we were doing, which became this whole sort of citywide neighborhood group based response teams with phone numbers and translated flyers and community meetings and stalls. Uh, and what we would call solidarity vigils, where we'd go to people's houses and, and wait outside in a way that hopefully kind of allowed them to be anonymized. A lot of people lived in big high rise flats. So that was kind of one, a weird benefit of that because um, there was this huge kind of tension, obviously, between putting people at risk who were very scared about being targeted for trying to resist the eviction, but also showing that there was great community strength to stop it. So we, we managed to do some of that. And then there was this huge kind of case by case NGO and legal fight as well, which did a lot of amazing work. And the, the kind of umbrella group was Stop Lock Change Evictions has recently changed their name to Roof Coalition. People want to look them up. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in a sort of historical way, I guess a lot of the people from this group, from the Evictions Network, um, probably situated themselves within these kind of inspiring struggles of rent strikes and housing rights in Glasgow, uh, alongside a kind of amazing history of uh, migrant led organizing and um, anti racist kind of activism in the city which has been going on for a long time, but I guess the particular key date being the kind of 2001 uh, when, when Glasgow became the only dispersal city in Scotland. And I think um, something Benjamin was saying there about the kind of role of local councils is again, would be really nice to hear a bit more about in terms of, we were mainly focusing our campaigns against the Home Office and against Circle, but we also had to kind of deal with the fact that Glasgow City Council were basically kind of washing their hands of any responsibility for people who might face evictions. Often, I mean, I remember the leader of the council at the time saying that she couldn't instruct her officers to break the law uh, because of no recourse to public funds. So there was this kind of barrier with them. They were saying the right things about how they cared, but they were saying they couldn't do anything. Uh, obviously, we knew that historically they'd run the whole system. And there's a much, there's an interesting history there about the way they used void housing and government, like central government money to kind of try and put people in these very uh, once uh, kind of for quite a long time vacated houses. Um, that's enough for me. I'll pass over to my friend Savan, who will tell us a bit about what's been happening a bit more now. But yeah, I guess basically in the end, there was an appeal to the, to the we were doing all this with the background of the court case. There was an appeal to the court case and sadly there was a counter appeal and govern law lost on every point. So even the Lord Tyre had said that these people didn't have the same housing rights as anyone else, he had actually said that, that Circo was operating like a public body. And he said that what they were doing was coercive. But sadly, in the counter appeal, that was lost as well. So there's sort of an interesting debate going on now, even at the highest level of Scott sessions. But um, yeah, sorry, I've gone over a bit there, but I'll just pass to Savannah. Um, Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Benjamin. And uh, thanks for everyone who organized this event. I'm quite privileged to be here and to speak out about some uh, I kind of, today I, I, I was trying to uh, concentrate on how asylum seekers live and actually why these campaigns and why this work, work's going on uh, to do that. So we have to show, you know, the struggles asylum seekers uh, day to day they, uh, they face. So uh, mine will be kind of different angle with what Joe and uh, Benjamin spoke about, but I hope it will cover uh, the reason, the facts behind what what's going on and why campaign and why we uh, as come office to take action. So basically, I'll start by saying 
seeking asylum in the world, but in particular the UK, it's a process of crashing you mentally into a thousand pieces. And physically, it's second living with such a label as A in your bones. Therefore, you need, you need to be masterpieces. Because of a lot of uncertainty in the process every day, every night, your subconscious and conscious mind want you to be ready to hear the bad news. Bad news that ultimately put your life in danger. So to put that into a context, every day you think, am I going to able to live like everyone else or am I going to be de deported and die in my country or evicted living in parks or under the bridge? So every day there are so many questions come up, so many why come up. Why am I excluded from living in a normal life? Why should I not be able to wear a decent piece of cloth? Why can I not have a right to choose the daily meals? Why should I always be worried about the time I'll be homeless? Why am I not allowed to have an access to labor like everyone else? So when you're an asylum seeker, you don't have a normal dream. That's most human would dream. You have nightmares. The dream about uh, your dreams is kind of like you've been deported in a country and uh, that you escaped from. And you're there and there is no way to escape. You're stuck and you'll face whatever fear you run away from. I bet, I bet if not every asylum seeker is but ninety percent of them have the same nightmare. Or a dream that you've received a post in a brown envelope. You don't want to open it. You don't dare to open it because uh, most of the times you know that's the time, that's, that's the news and that's what you're scared of. It's the news that you, it will put you on the street in a week or so. And it's the news that uh, leaves you hungry for as long as they want. So people in the hotel now suffering from not having access to proper healthcare. There is no mental support. The place are not covered secure, so far I asked. Uh, so they treat you like criminals, restricting on their uh, financial support and limited to just over nine pound a week. And women that came from different countries and so-called different culture and different social norms, they were struggling to get sanitary products either because they were required to ask the receptionist to provide them such a product, which is not easy for women to ask such a personal need. Also, uh, also a product which is not, uh, right, because there's two minutes left. I was just trying to go on a conclusion, sorry. So in conclusion, I will just make this scenario for all of you to have a similar feeling of asylum seekers in the hotels and in general in the UK to do that. So I would like to imagine when you wake up tomorrow, you only have two choices to do. One choice, uh, to face your death, inhuman treatment, torture by authorities because of your political belief or face uh, society uh, ashamed you because of sexual orientation or because of your religion or accept uh, this kind of lifestyle. So you wake up, pack up your stuff and next hour or so you will sleep whatever someone else will choose it for and you no longer have a right, your, your, your bank card, your, your car, no place for your kids to play. Think about someday you have to choose between your kids' birthday cake or your milk. So you're always going to be vulnerable to be evicted, left with no support by any means, and by the way, you're not allowed to support yourself. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish it with this with this quote. Some people saying, "I'd rather I'd, I'd rather die stand, uh, rather uh, I, I would I'd rather die stand than living on my knees." But I'm gonna say, asylum seekers are dying every day on their knees. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Savan, um, and to Joel as well, um, for sharing about uh, the work that No Evictions is doing up in Glasgow and what's going on uh, in the system. Um, I'm going to introduce um, the Our Homes Renters Research Project, which is a participatory action research project um, that's come out of the Hackney branch of the London Renters Union. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Tosin and Aga who are uh, two of the uh, researchers employed by the union to carry out this amazing project. And they've got an upcoming film called Hostile Housing, which is gonna be showing the fruits of all of their research. So pass over to Aga and Tosin, please. Hi everyone. Thanks for inviting us and that we can share a little bit about the endeavors that we uh, uh, took in the summer, uh, 2019, when uh, London Renters Union Hackney branch um, employed basically a group of uh, renters who um, experience um, some difficulties around housing uh, or are just being interested like in, in the whole 
crisis. Um, so basically, um, the project uh, itself um, uh, used the, the method of the um, participatory research practice, which in our case, we, uh, we used film as an action for social change. So, um, so among participants, they were, um, I don't want to mention the names, but um, there were like five, around five people. Uh, who were like just renters of all kinds and having different issues. And uh, it was facilitated by professional filmmakers um, who basically led all the process of, you know, standing behind in front of camera, having interviews. So um, the main purpose, basically, it was to, to core research um, and produce a, a film that would um, be asking the uh, like open question of what are the problems, what, what, who is responsible for it and what the change we need to make. And um, so participants uh, were, were sharing their own experiences at first. Um, so among them, the, the, there was a young person who, who was sleeping rough for five years, a um, person with sickle cells who didn't have a heating for, I think, around 20 years. And um, part of, 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 of the movie was also when we went and uh, protest in front of uh, the, the landlord big building in central London. Um, or uh, in my situation, I was living in um, um, emergency uh, temporary accommodation with my two children, which was a very tiny room um, with no cooking facilities and, um, you know, all kinds of uh, <laughs> difficult things like shared toilets. And, and along that, we also, we, um, we really break our heads uh, to, to kind of uh, address um, the main, the main um, kind of um, issues surrounding who are asking, is, is it, is it a, a right of a human being to have a home? Uh, is it, a, a, do we have this right ready <laughs> for, for a home? Um, in my little, um, you know, um, inquiry uh, with um, public um, members of the public, um, I would ask that question: if, 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 if someone would be given like few meter square uh, place to stay, uh, would they be able to call it home? And especially that it didn't have uh, cooking facilities, and that's also led to um, further question, you know, like um, how difficult for, for a mother is to be homeless when you, you, you don't have home, which is your role is to, to, to give a home to children. Um, and so basically each member brought uh, some, some, something, something different to the, to the project. And there was a lot about uh, uh, the rights of immigrants and asylum seekers, how they are like terribly um, affected by, by, by this, this um, uh, hostile environment uh, policy that was brought in 2010, as far as I know. So out of all this, you know, kind of at first um, our conversations and 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 um, and a very very uh, um, difficult stories that we shared uh, we also um, reach out to to um, common people on the street and we were asking about their stories we also um, um, approached uh, people who who were uh, dedicated to fight for 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 against um, housing crisis, um, 
like activists and people who work on, on in the temporary accommodation groups or with asylum seekers and and uh, we gathered like uh, a lot of uh, documentation that we um, that we at the moment trying to um, um, put like create the website and put all these short videos but also we are later this year um, we are going to launch the, the, the movie that is um, the product of this co-creation, this co-research and co-creation. Um, and we call the movie uh, Hostile Housing. So um, that's kind of a background of, of, of what happened. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of um, maybe leave some space for later on questions and um, some deeper, <laughs> you know, question coming out of um, of this whole topic. Now, thank you. Thank you, Aga. Um, and I think as well, um, Aga's kind of given a really kind of a personal first-hand description of the project and I say that because the way the project was kind of set out was that they identified a group of people um, you know you applied um, a group of people that were either suffering from kind of issues with social housing um, whether it be as you were part of that generation or whether it's passed down to you so in my case it was my mom and that was passed down to me and so I grew up in this sort of hostile housing in effect growing up as an immigrant and only realizing when I was 18 so living in the UK as a London citizen um, and in, in the case of sort of Agatha's situation she was able was happy to kind of tell her story through the film um, but also before I continue as well um, I just want to say thank you for actually kind of taking the time to have us here um, and I think the the kind of power in the people that have spoken before us is that you're kind of able to have this conversation from the perspective of you know the people that are kind of in the spaces of law the people that are in the spaces of pure action um, but also the people that are in the spaces of kind of the raw reality that is the sort of existential issues um, and I think when stepping into this project um, a lot of us didn't necessarily know exactly how it was going to pan out um, all we knew was that there's an issue with social housing and um, apparently we're going to make a film about it. So let's let's go. Let's see what this is saying. Um, and so in effect, what ended up happening was we all came together. We all told our stories to each other. This was a regular meeting uh, once a week going on for, I think it was like three months. Um, it ended up going on for a bit longer in terms of kind of like editing and actually getting footage. Um, so we had to do a lot of overtime, but in effect, the idea was that we would come together and we would partake in workshops with the intention of kind of bringing out the ideas. Um, so yeah, we identified four different stories. Aga's story was one of them. Um, and there were three other people. Um, again, without saying any names, the kind of direction of these stories all took different pathways and they were all communicate in different ways. Um, and yeah, man, it's important to note that none of us were really activists. And in noting that you're kind of able to understand why some of us were expressing our stories in certain ways. So I know in term of in terms of Aga, like she come came from a sort of performance background. And so to express a story was very much a sort of performative public engagement where um, without kind of revealing too much of what is going to happen in the film, um, she ended up inquiring and speaking to a lot of people. Um, in terms of one of the other speakers, um, he kind of comes from a sort of ex-criminal background. Um, and so for him, kind of keeping that sort of raw experience of it, um, or the raw reality even, was really was really key. So for him, it was about having a conversation where the cameraman is literally just following him down the street and he's kind of walking you through uh, his upbringing and trying to explain to you how he got to this point. And basically just revealing that there are so many instances of failure that have happened in his life. 
and now he's at this point. Um, in another case, it's I've been um, one of the subjects who was ex a sick cell patient. Um, again, he was he wasn't granted heating for um, over a decade, um, and so for him expressing that was really about yo, I'm I'm really pissed off. And so we got a lot of the London Renters Union and we started protesting outside of the Guinness offices. And that is how we expressed that story. Um, and it was really powerful, man. We learned a lot. We understood and kind of unpacked how sort of race and policies meant to sort of target migrants kind of intersected to create this kind of cluster of issues. And truth be told, uh, we, I, I can't really explain it very well, um, but what I'm going to do uh -huh, is quickly share screen and actually show uh, a minute or two clip from an intellect that we ended up um, interviewing. So, and yeah, I need not play the whole clip, but I think this is a really powerful segment um, in London Fields, if anyone's interested to how it governed the world and how it developed its economy. But of course, in the post-imperial period, the post-colonial period, when people from those colonies began to migrate to Britain in significant numbers after World War II. And so that's the other thing that makes empire so important, I guess, is because it makes Britain what it is today. It makes Britain multicultural. It makes British society as vibrant as it is. And it continues to shape Britain being a global political power and, of course, a very wealthy nation as well. Wow, powerful stuff. Um, that's, you painted a, a vivid picture of how we have got here today. And that is a good segue to the next question, which is, do you see a connection between Britain its colonies, immigration and housing. So, of course, Britain and its colonies have been uh, intrinsically linked for hundreds of years, right, for many of them. And so when people talk about immigration um, and people coming to Britain, I think it's less helpful to think about people coming to Britain from Africa, from Asia, from the Caribbean. We used to think about Britain coming to them hundreds of years ago. And it's that relationship between Britain and its colonies in Africa, the Caribbean and South Asia and elsewhere that has led to people coming to Britain from those countries over the past 50 or 60 years. Its relationship with housing, I think, is really interesting as well. So when people came to Britain um, from Britain's colonies in significant numbers after World War II, they often found it very, very difficult to find housing. Uh, you had uh, signs up in people's um, homes saying no dogs, no blacks, no Irish, uh, before formal racism um, had been uh, outlawed um, in this country in the 1960s. And in places like the East End of London, um, where you had large Bangladeshi communities, it was very, very difficult for them to find secure housing, not only because of um, issues of poverty and inequality, but also attacks from the far right, where their homes are being firebombed and attacked um, on a fairly consistent basis. And so... Um, and I think the kind of power in that explanation um, and kind of how he's able to connect it to sort of deep-rooted history um, really revealed to us a lot of this sort of intersectionality, um, whether it is in the completely negative side of things, but also on the positive side of things, in that, so I mean, like the, the birth of Carnival and the fact that that was kind of used as a sort of process, an expression of escapism and a kind of way to, to really enjoy a culture that is kind of feels threatened in the space of Britain. And because of that, we ended up filming at Carnival. We ended up, and it, it really felt like a bit of a break from the, I think just the constant um, negative unraveling of the truth and that can really feel overwhelming. And so Carnival was a, a really enjoyable part of um, the recording and the kind of filming process. But yeah, I think there was a lot going on. I'm happy to take any questions a bit later as well. And yeah, that's a little bit from me. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much, Tozin. Um, and um, that was really, really brilliant. I'm really excited about this film when it comes out and how it's going to be joining so many of the dots between uh, lots of different kinds of histories and also the way you talked about people, you know, having their own histories as well as like the broader, wider history of everything that's going on. 
Um, so we're going to pass over to um, the historians. Um, and I've, I, as I've said before, like in History Acts, um, historians don't present papers. We just ask them to talk quite conversationally about anything uh, that's really resonated for them in what the activists or the different groups have just presented and what kind of chimes or feels resonant in terms of the research they've done or uh, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to pass over to Amy Grant. Amy Grant is a um, PhD history a student at the University of East Anglia, um, who is researching um, the sanctuary movement in the kind of 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, so I'll just pass over to Amy just now. Hello, um, thank you for letting me speak today. And I just wanted to say that everything that everyone's talked about and all the work you've been doing has been really inspirational to hear. So thank you so much. Um, so I'll give you a brief insight into some of the research that I've been doing and then try and make some connections with everything that's been said. Um, so my work currently focuses on sanctuary campaigns in 1918 and 1919 Britain, wherein a number of people facing deportation from the British state began invoking the ancient tradition of sanctuary um, attempting to circumvent authorities by seeking shelter in churches, religious spaces and community spaces. So the Home Office then faced the dilemma of dragging those in sanctuary out by force or bowing to pressure and um, backtracking their deportation orders which both options for them were seen as quite embarrassing um, so this could have decidedly mixed results and um, some people were granted leave to remain by the home office literally within a matter of days of entering sanctuary and others ended up living in churches for months and even years sometimes only to be deported in the end anyway so it was a very powerful tactic and it got a lot of um, exposure, but it also could be very grueling for everyone involved, um, particularly those facing deportation. Um, but this caught on with certain activist circles and in this decade or so we see about a dozen fully fledged sanctuary campaigns. Um, and they're all sort of in mosques, temples and churches, but they're also linked together with various anti-factorite, anti-imperialist, anti-racist and generally leftist organisations that we had in this country at this time. Um, the most famous one that I'll just briefly mention was a uh, sanctuary held for Virad Mendes, who was a Sri Lankan communist um, and he was in sanctuary uh, in a church in Manchester from 86 to 89, so nearly three years. And the organising Virad Mendes defence defend campaign accumulated massive support across Manchester and wider, even internationally. Um, they organised participations and rallies with thousands of people, marches, petitions, 24-hour vigils. The flats surrounding the church had balcony, you know, had graffiti all over them, saying we support for Raj. Um, yeah, and it all sort of centred around this one little guy who was a little beardy, spectacled fellow with quite bad stammer, but he became this sort of international news feature. Um, eventually he was pulled out by the police. They stormed the church in the early hours in the morning and dragged him out and took him straight to Central Prison where he was deported to Sri Lanka. And it looked really bad. They had even at even at Heathrow Airport they had um, activists kind of forming and blockading things on the tarmac. So what does this tell us about conflicts? over asylum in the 1980s and how does this sort of link in today? Um, unfortunately, the main sort of similarity that I can see is that it's the same debate between sort of law, um, very on the one hand, and human humanitarian, you know, the, the physical reality of it on the other hand. And um, this changing goalposts of the law over and over again. So the 1980s um, was kind of the boiling point of um, successive governments restricted immigration policies um, in 62, 68, and 71, and colliding with increasing demand on asylum processes, because a lot of that as well was that Commonwealth uh, citizens who would have previously just been allowed in were now not being allowed in and their only way forward was asylum speaking. Um, so we see this in this period, this sort of fight between what it meant for Britain to be a leading liberal democracy and the government's way around this because they wanted to hold up their notion of being 
a good humanitarian power. Um, as well as state in control, sort of offer asylum to an increasingly small amount of people, increasingly harder restrictions and procedures to prove it. Um, and then the rest, um, people that didn't quite qualify for this were labelled bogus um, scroungers, sort of undeserving cheats who were ruined for the good refugees. Um, and this isn't an age-old rhetoric that we still see today, but sort of from 1985 is where we really get this panic over numbers, not people. Um, yeah, and it's in this messy area of sort of redefining that this is where we saw sanctuary campaign um, playing out. Um, responding to some of the things that you were saying, I was thinking um, at, the, at the beginning it was mentioned about the role of lawyers and where they fall into this. And um, from what I've seen um, with the sanctuary campaign, the lawyers are absolutely vital. And I think the idea to feel that you're an imposter, not an activist, is no like they're really really essential to because so much of this with the home office is getting out of things with small little wordings and things lawyers are essential for that translation really um and I'd, yeah i'd say they're absolutely vital and then the role of of of, of the activist dimension um i think what i saw with the sanctuary campaigns is that they became sort of it might be to do with it they were obviously a physical place quite often and because they're a physical place people could drop in and that they really helped build up the growth the grassroots element of things um it became sort of a two-way street you know like people all around the community and it got people involved who wouldn't normally be involved but i think what that activist dimension does sort of emotionally as well was really important because it it can break down the distance between the raw reality of, of what people are facing and, and activists on the other hand and that's really important that sort of physical encounter which you know we can do all this amazing stuff online but sometimes actually speaking to people I think can be really and also I think it can provide um sort of I mean asylum seekers and activists you know you can it's a horrible environment for everyone and, and sometimes a good way of sort of fighting that activist fatigue I think is what I've found from people I've been speaking to can be in in sharing and sharing your skills or you know going to a carnival or things like that that can be a really good way of carrying on the momentum as well the, the negative side of that is when the campaign builds up so much and so much and gets so much exposure and is successful in the case of Farage anyway, he actually, it was a double-edged sword because he became an example that the government also wanted to make sure he was never going to win because of that, but other cases did win. Um, but yeah, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword, I think. Is that a good starting point? <laughs> Thanks so much, Amy. Um, that's really brilliant. Um, and um, as I um, have may have said um nicole um jackson who is going to be joining us tonight can't join um because of um unforeseen family commitments um but we're really really lucky to have um becky taylor come to share a few a few reflections on um on what folks have presented tonight and um becky researches histories of state expansion migration ideologies and violence as well as histories of empire xenophobia and identity um, and they explore intersections between national, imperial and international structures in the regulation of migration, refugee movements and public health and welfare. Um, and they've also written an essay that I would really, really, really recommend um, that I've really, really enjoyed, which is like looking quite specifically about um, uh, about one of the refugee camps um, that was uh, operating in the 1970s during the Uganda Asians crisis sorry what the government called the uganda asians crisis at the time um which would be really interesting to think about um uh, the use of uh military ballots and like the what's happening at the moment with the home office plans around uh refugee camps at the moment so i'll just pass over to becky just now thank you fee um that was a nice introduction thanks so much um everyone who's spoken and it's 
when I sort of, whenever I have to sort of think about this, I think on the one hand, as historians, we have nothing to offer because things are so much worse now than they have been in the past. And I think, you know, Amy mentioned 1985, and I think since the mid 80s, we have seen an increasingly hostile, um, you know, viciously hostile environment, which has been deliberately constructed through the asylum acts of the 1990s, you know, well, well before the hostile environment became an explicit um, policy under May. And it has been there to, as you know, Savan so um, explicitly expressed it, it's been there to de dehumanise people and to separate asylum seekers from the rest of British society and to make it the worst possible option for for anyone so on so on the one hand when I'm sort of faced with something like this I go oh my word you know um what can we as historians offer to that but then also when you listen to everybody in the round I'm sort of struck by I've got sort of four or five sort of small points that I want to make and maybe we can draw them more out in discussion and I know there's a couple of people in the audience who will have you know their own expertise to add whose names I recognize and obviously other people too so the first thing I think is really when we think if we sort of take a long view of the his history of welfare and immigration and asylum and refugees in the 20th century I think so often um I think it's useful to think how um how not just refugees but all migrants how they're treated by the welfare state mirrors what's happening more more broadly in the welfare state so when we in the 1930s not very many british people um had secure access to welfare support the means test was very very harsh and very few people and in that period under the aliens legislation so alien as anyone who wasn't a british subject coming in including jewish refugees um they also had no recourse to the welfare state whatsoever and they were expected to um, be be supported um, by private means or their own, own means or they faced deportation. In the post-war period with the expansion of the welfare state we similarly see more generous um, measures being extended towards refugees and migrants in in general too and then come the 1980s and beyond when we see the shrinking of the welfare state in in general what we also then see is the shrinking and um of, of benefits and access um by asylum seekers and refugees as well and so i think that's sort of it's sort of a useful barometer in that sense because if we think today in fact you know although things are measurably far worse for asylum seekers the we've all seen over the last year and in previous years people who are struggling on universal credit and once again that you know that is a system that is a de dehumanizing system and so what we have got is I think so often, you know, rightist governments and the narrative from the right is asylum seekers and immigrants are stealing from the great British pu public. And if they weren't there, then we would have um, a flourishing NHS. We would all have council houses and X, Y and Z. But the reality is, is that when the pot is made smaller, it is made smaller for everybody. And the fact that asylum seekers are struggling in that is one symbol of the fact that it's been shrunk for everybody. So I think if we're sort of thinking about messages of solidarity and activism and organizing, rather than accepting those divisions that exist, that, that the right tries to impose between the quotes, you know, very often the white working class or the working class or local people and immigrants and asylum seekers, we actually see that people should be fighting a common cause. And I think that's one of the things that came out for me in the um, in the hostile housing, that actually it was people across the spectrum um, of people living in Britain. It's not just people who are living um, under threat of de deportation who struggle with poor housing. So many people in the UK struggle with poor housing. And by making that plain and, and making a common cause, um, we can start fighting those rightist narratives and say, no, it's because you have been shrinking the pot not because they are taking from us because you know we are all us apart from you so that's sort of 
one sort of long sort of historical trend I would um, sort of draw out. Glasgow was mentioned as the sort of the first city of dis dispersal. In fact, dispersal is something that has been practiced on refugees, certainly since the 30s. The idea, you know, refugees are seen as a problem when they turn up. They're administratively annoying. Um, you know, no state wants to have to deal with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and one of the, and, and they're always seen as being a threat. Um, to the British way of life, you know, quotes. And one of the ways that the state has tried to manage that and how many NGOs also tried to manage it over the years is by dispersing refugees. So we see it with the Jews, we see it with the Hungarians in 1956-57 who've been um, fleeing the Soviet invasion. We see it with the Ugandan Asians. In fact, under the Ugandan Asians, Britain is divided into red areas and green areas. Um, the red areas were going to be called black areas, but they decided that was a bit too racist even for them. So they called them red areas. These, these were areas that were already, quotes, full of migrants. And so Uganda nations were to be di directed away from places like Leicester and sent a lot to Scotland, um, where, you know, Scotland actually has got a much better tradition of community activism and welcome of uh, refugees and asylum seekers than the rest of the UK. Um, but because many Uganda nations wanted to be close to their families actually and they didn't want to be in Wick um, or in Venice or Dun Dundee and so they moved because uh, because what, what people know now and, and they knew at the time and it was experienced by the Vietnamese when they came in in the early 80s that dispersal works against the interests of refugees and asylum seekers when you move to a foreign country what you want is as much familiarity as possible. So having um, access to language services that are run by people who also speak your language, people who understand your, your culture and your traditions, where you've got access to community centres, um, religious organisations that support your, your needs. Those are clustered in places where there are large numbers of um, people from your country all already. And so dis dis dispersal very actively works against that. And we can, and although at the end of the um, Vietnamese um, dispersal program, the Home Office admitted that it, it, it had failed the refugees they were settling. And they very explicitly said that they would never implement that policy again because it had been so, so damaging. But of course, that's not what we see. And in the 90s and beyond, you know, back comes dispersal as a tactic for undermining the, re, you know, the ability of refugees and asylum seekers to start to rebuild a new life for themselves you know and what we persistently see over history is where people are given access to normally English language classes stable housing the opportunity for getting work and into education those are the people who who flourish and manage to build new lives for themselves in the country as quickly as possible the way asylum seekers are treated today is exactly against that and I think you know Savannah just brought that out so very movingly and so clearly and you know the the horrible reality is that what, what people are experiencing today is you know counter to decades and decades of um, experience which tells us that what has been done to them is exactly the wrong thing you know then my sort of final uh, I've got two sort of points before um because I don't want to run on too much the other thing that I think that <laughs> It's very easy to paint, if you're sort of looking at refugee history, it's very easy to paint a very gloomy history of it and you end up thinking how horrible Britain is as a place. But one of the things that I always find heartening and we find traces in the archives is people working to resist those government policies and you know whether it's what we think of as being NGOs or whether it's people who are activists and fighting on the streets you know again we have traditions going back to the 30s of people standing in solidarity alongside refugees and asylum seekers and you know doing things so if, you know you mentioned the Ugandan nations I mean there we see both shelter and child poverty action group doing very similar work actually to the um, work of the hostile housing thing that they were collecting very detailed case case studies and 
histories of people's experiences of the welfare system and the housing system and sought to use that as a way to bludgeon government into changing its policy and increasing the, the resources um, for refugees and asylum seekers. So although the, the work that Amy has done um, is very much specifically on activist um, groups, we also see that as being part of a wider pool of um, more progressive responses and people who see that people coming to this country, A, have a right as a human being for safety and dignity of treatment, but also they see it as being part of an expression of um, wanting to build a better and a more pro progressive nation and working in solidarity with each other. And so that I think is one of the things that we can take heart from that there always have been people who um, have struggled alongside refugees and asylum seekers. And I think we will um, see that um, carrying on into the future. It's just working out the tools that work the best. Um, I'll stop there. I've got more things to say, but I'll stop. Okay, thank you so much, um, Becky. Um, that was really, really brilliant. Um, so we're gonna move into the uh, kind of the wider discussion part of the event just now. So. Just a reminder to, um, to text into me as a private message, um, a question that you want to ask um, and I will, and, and let me know if you want me to read your question or if you want to speak as well. I'm gonna try and um, keep uh, contributions to questions um, as much as possible. So we, I know that also the panel will have questions for one another and to go back and forth. Um, and, we've, and we've got a wee while for this as well. Um, not got any questions that have come in yet, so I'm going to jump in and ask a question myself. Um, um, so we've spoken a lot about, um, particularly with uh, no evictions and also with some of the histories as well, and obviously with lots of the stuff that's going on in terms of the asylum evictions, as well as like the new refugee camps that have been set up. We've talked a lot about um, asylum seekers and restrictions on asylum seeking support, but just to go back to like the kind of joining up of the dots that um, Tozin and Aga were doing in their project. Um, I was just wondering if any of the activist panels were up for thinking about, um, yeah, how dehumanizing housing conditions or yeah, dehumanizing housing inequalities connect to the kind of dehumanization um, of uh, migrants and refugees uh, in really, in racializing ways um, and, and what you think about as the role and the history of empire in creating those kinds of racism um, and oppression um, and in your activist organizing does is that concept of empire does that come up for you guys obviously we saw that with uh, Tozin and Aga's interview with Adam Elliott Cooper a little bit but to talk about um, if maybe Savannah or Joel wanted to talk about that at all or um, any of the other panelists at all. I'll be happy to give it a go if, if that's okay. So about uh, about the, the two question you wrote about the housing, how is that connected? So I was uh, I was I was gonna say you know housing in general was like we all know is is a central for uh, for 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 safety net like for for you if, if you can't get to access access to healthcare if you don't have house you can uh, get work if you don't have house and in in general and for. Uh, particularly in asylum, uh, in the asylum process, when you're asylum seeker, I've, uh, I, I'm sure you're not going to surprise that I was an asylum seeker. So, so uh, when you don't have work, so I was sleeping under the bridge. I wasn't allowed to get a house, even if someone was trying to pay for the rent, because there's a status check, you know. So it, it's a, it's a it's a broader issue about housing and and, and the connection between asylum seekers and housing is is quite vital I think for my opinion and I might be wrong but I hope everyone agree that every asylum seeker uh, need to have a right to access uh, to house or at least have a right to, to access to support itself because what usually home office and put and, and, and in a political way so the propaganda is, is putting on the media saying asylum seekers is taking uh, taking our house taking our jobs and stuff like that but that, that, that actually not true I was I was just on the house of common and, and I just took out some so some some of the uh, documents so about uh, what they do they they're actually paying 250 million pound per year to to just not let asylum seekers work and support themselves why would you do that i mean i'll just let them to support themselves and to engage with the labor and that will be 
uh, that will be benefiting um, the integration pro uh, the integration process that was uh, Becky was talking about as well. So yeah, for for that the and, and the second question was about uh, uh, the colonization and decolonization. So. I'm 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 a Kurd I mean, ethically, so I'm one of the. I don't know if you can call a victim, but uh, obviously in history, so Britain and France and Italy, they came to my country. So it's like 19, 19 uh, I think it's about 100 years, over 100 years ago. Uh, so they came and they actually uh, separated I mean, Kurdistan, and because of the uh, of the fear of Ottoman Empire in in Middle East, because they thought the Ottoman Empire is is, is a threat. To their, uh, to their power in the Middle East. So because of that, Kurdish people now they're fighting many years, like 30 years in uh, 30 years and over in, in Turkey and in Iran over 25 years. And because of these people are running away from these countries, they, they, they're trying to seek it, you know, uh, uh, they try to run away from complex zones. So I think uh, in that perspective uh, and in that way, of course, there's a big connection between the colonization and 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 I think it's Britain's responsibility. It's it's, it's a UK responsibility as, as alongside with the global uh, responsibility we have to take uh, because of the history each country have. So uh, I think there's a big connection for that. I'm I'm one of the victims. If if I had my own country, uh, uh, what you call, if I had my nation or my own nation state, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't actually run away. So thank you, if anyone else. I can just add a tiny bit. I mean, obviously that, yeah. So thanks again, Savan. Like, um, I think just in terms of your question for you, like, I'd be interested to hear from the others because I think like what Savan just, again, just very powerfully put to me is that like, we, we do talk in No Evictions Network all the time internally about those histories of empire and colonialism. But my impression is that at least at the kind of like, media level that's that has subsided in terms of like that angle and that kind of argument being made uh maybe that's changing at the moment i hope it is because i think it's a very powerful argument that we need to make more um that, that that you know these these there's a kind of colonial reparation essentially there's a there's a history of colonialism that britain is fundamentally failing to address and in many ways it's you know if people have written in loads of ways that i won't be able to eloquently put but you know there's a kind of colonial like asphasia like this is that's the kind of inability to like deal with it and that is really leads to this sense of entitlement um, um or this kind of yeah uh, inculcated sense of entitlement amongst other groups that i think the state is really pushing um so yeah i think i think it'd be interesting to talk because i the other link to me that we haven't managed to talk about much but you know there's hundreds of people right now like someone was saying living in these um, budget hotels that were basically turned into kind of essentially detention centers that's what we that's why you know that this phrase hotel detention came out of the people that we're working with all the time um in those places and i think that that's another link and you know and when you look at the tension we've talked about this a bit but it's like you know i think you should see it you, you can see those connections between the colonial history and the kind of colonial prison in really um stark ways and you can see that with the people in there how you know I, I, I'm a visitor to Dungavel Detention Centre in Scotland. I visit there quite a lot, and it's like, yeah, people in there, uh, by and large, are coming like from countries that Britain once colonised or and or was at war with. Um, and then in the last five six years, a, a big wedge of people from Eastern Europe, which I think speaks to the film in a really powerful way as well. So there's like, you know, you can see how different groups get put in these places, and that's what's happening right now with the hotels and with the with the um with the barracks because the home office can't as easily remove people with the pandemic so i think yeah i'd be interested to i'd be interested to know if people think that that's like shifted like for instance in amy's work like whether the kind of colonial history was a key part because my looking into the history a bit myself it does seem like that was like kind of the home office as a racist institution was a much stronger argument the home office as like a kind of neo-colonial institution was an argument you were hearing a lot more from people saying, well, look, well, you, you colonized my country and now I'm here. So like deal with it. That, that kind of was a, was a different argument. You know, I don't think we see quite as much in, at the moment, but anyway, I'll stop there. Um, thanks, Van and Joel. Um, actually, that's a perfect moment to bring in. We're very lucky to have Nigel Dinaronha with us tonight, um, who is a professor and researcher um, looking at histories of housing and geographies of housing and race and migration. And, uh, I also know that Nigel was part of um, Asian youth movement organizing during the 80s. 
uh, in Manchester. Um, and yeah, maybe Nigel, you could um, reflect on some of the lessons um, from 80s activism to now. Um, okay, well, thanks for um, the opportunity to talk. I suppose there's, there's a few things that pick up some of the points you, you've you made. Um, first of all, I suppose what the Asian Youth Movement in Man Manchester was very focused on deportation campaigns, anti-deportation campaigns, work very closely with South Manchester Law Centre. So in terms of Ben's kind of concerns about the relationship and the role of law alongside activists, I think that was very, um, very much part of the picture. Um, and thinking also about the way the local state operated. So Manchester kind of declared itself as an anti-deportation city. It sponsored coaches to take people on marches. It got very involved and, and some would argue that that undermined the role of community in terms of building support. Um, but it was kind of clear that the local state had a position where they were supporting Virad, for example, in his struggle to stay in Britain and, and many other people. Um, and the national state operated differently in that we could lobby our MPs and have some kind of effect. So kind of petitions mattered. There was an internal appeal system that went through a number of stages where protests could be organized and so on. So there was a lot more um, potential for activism at that point, which seems to have been shut down um, through what Becky described as a kind of series of different acts. And I think having kind of come through um, that process of activism, I then became an academic much later in life. And um, just reflecting a little on a, on a couple of things about that. So um, kind of trying to understand what's going on now in terms of borders. We can see that the borders have moved from being quite loose um, encouraging a workforce to come here and to do certain types of jobs. Um, and at first from the kind of old colonies from the new Commonwealth and so on, and then um, in different ways from Europe. Um, but what you, you can see from there is you then had the policies described around asylum, um, around removing the rights of appeals and so on, to a point where now we're running internal borders. So we have borders within housing. You can't access housing if you don't have a right to be here. You can't get a bank account. You can't access education. You can't access the health service. So we've moved from a state where the border was outside and it's something we protected to a state where the border's inside and where the machine to remove people, to put them in detention and to deport them is a part of day-to-day -day life. And I want to kind of raise a challenge here from, from my colleagues because Working in a university um, until, until COVID came along, the border operated in the corridor of our building. Um, when I was at Manchester doing my PhD um, only a few years ago, I went along to a meeting that was organized um, with a unit that was placed in the local police station that was going around starting the clock on people sleeping on the streets. Um, and after three months was going back and uh, deporting them. Those are Europeans. So, and what, what they were coming to the university for was some help with understanding how to get at these people, how to contact them, ways to work with them. And I, I, I should, I would have hoped to have said the university told them to go away, but the university didn't tell them to go away. It cleared homeless encampments on its prompt premises and some parts of the university jumped at the opportunity to work on this collaboration with the border agency, the police and the local council. So that brings me to a place where I'm saying what was a kind of hostile central policy built on a regime of kind of anti-immigrant sentiment and a kind of perception was a lot looser in the 80s than it is now. And the local state, local institutions like ours are part of that mechanism. We have a systemic anti-immigrant, anti-racist perspective. And I think to, to kind of finish that off, there's a very messy boundary between being a migrant, an asylum seeker, and from a minority. And those kind of boundaries are blurred when we look at what's going on. So um, just to recount very personally, I suppose, um, my mother came to Britain on a 
UK, uh, British, Britain and its colonies passport. Um, she was part of what might be classed as the Windrush generation who could have been subject to deportation. She was very good at her paperwork, so she got nationality and so on. So that didn't happen to us, but it is that generation. So I was born in Britain in the 50s, and yet I could have been subject to that regime if my parents had been less disorganized, which shows how far the state has gone in terms of creating this kind of hostility. And I, I kind of, I really don't know where we go with activism now, because I do think we're so polarized that we hear the arguments about imperialism, about colonialism, we understand them, and a whole set of other people don't. Um, and we have a particularly hostile government at the moment. So I think I, I kind of moving more towards the only way to do this is to resist, really. And I, I really respect those activists who are out there doing that work. Um, because listening to what people's lives are like, it, it's absolutely necessary. And I think to reflect back from the academy, I don't think it's necessarily good enough for us just to describe the world. I think we have to seek to change it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nigel. Um, do any of the panelists want to come back to anything um, in Nigel's point there? There's a couple of questions here, but I also want to um, come back to, I think that really important question that Benjamin posed at the start, which was about kind of the role of litigation and legal work within, in relation to activists and other kinds of things. So just wanted to make sure that didn't get dropped, that question, if any of the other panelists wanted to talk back to that point at all. Or I've also got lots of um, great questions coming from the audience as well. Um, I'd just say in every camp campaign that I've looked at, um, especially in 1980s Manchester, there was key uh, lawyers and law centres that were doing really great work that helped that go through. So in Manchester, there, um, there was a guy called Steve Cohen and his archives are a large part of what I look at now. And he just dedicated his whole entire life to that work and made such a difference. Um, I actually think he died now a few years ago, but somebody said to me that he was still trying to think to work on his death. So it gives a massive difference, I think. And just giving the, the, giving the um, activists more of an idea of what, what points will actually make a difference legally as opposed to morally. You know. um, great, I'm going to take a question from James Cronin. James, do you want to, to come on screen to say your question or I can also read it? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'll just put on my video as well. Uh, so my question is, to what extent are the histories of vagrancy and criminality positioning the migrant as essentially a failed citizen? And it's just that a, a lot of the discussion I think today is focusing on that notion of how do we construct the citizen uh, and particularly, I suppose, the relevance of citizenship in a post-Brexit context. Thank you. Do you want me to come in on, I can say something on that? That sounds great. Okay, so I mean, I think the thing we have, if we're sort of a citizen, then typically there'd be somebody who has, you know, rights um, to vote or to claim welfare, those sorts of things. We have to, and in that sense, there's a lot of the British population didn't have those kind of rights before the late 19th, early 20th century. And certainly vagrants, you know, as they were called at, at the time, weren't seen as being people who were citizens. And of course, what you get in, you know, particularly with something, the, the example that's always given is the, uh, the conscription or the people who um, put themselves forward uh, during the Boer War. Um, they came up as volunteers and a third of those people were turned away because they weren't physically healthy enough. And there was this kind of crisis at the, you know, of the, I, I wouldn't say conscious, was a crisis of empire, of um, the British state, the different organs of it and the elite essentially saying, well, if 
if we haven't got a system, you know, if we don't have a subjecthood who can fight for the British Empire, then Germany is going to take over, France is going to take over our leading position. So it's, it's not really until the beginning of the 20th century and we start seeing the state investing in its population through um, universal education to begin with, then, you know, more gradually. Um, you know, by the middle of the century, but also things like national in insurance. But it's so that's if that's sort of if we think about it, it's sort of citizenship in a kind of a hard sense. And I think it's certainly, but what we also get at the same time, and we see it a lot. So some of the work that I've done is also on gypsies and travelers. That's one of my main areas of research, apart from refugees. And we similarly see in the 20 across the 20th century certain groups of people seen as being failed citizens particularly in the post-war period the way you have the potential benefits of the welfare state and because you haven't chosen to take them up then you are personally at fault for this and so um you know i was struck um when tossin and Aga were talking about one of their um, the people in their film who spoke, who sort of walked along the street and they recounted their personal story of the multiple harms that they'd experienced over the course of their life lifetime, which had led them to the position that they were in. And in fact, you know, what the elite and what the state often have failed to do is understand the multiple harms that are enacted upon people. So rather than them being, you know, failed citizens we might think of us as having a failed state who is failing its citizens and i think that there isn't enough of a narrative that sort of flips that and very often what we have is um you know people going i'm not a failed citizen but they are you know and there's the sort of this this the scapegoating of the person who's one step down on the scale to you because it gives you a bit of distance and it gives you a bit of a sense of security and I think you know we should refuse to fight on those grounds and sort of turn it and say no you as a state are failing your citizens and I think and 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 anyone and and in fact the other thing that I think is quite interesting is it's actually in the post in the, sort of the 30 years after the second world war you didn't have to be a british citizen to have the benefits of the welfare state it was simply about being a resident of the uk so if you were in britain you had a right to certain welfare and certain services it didn't matter about your passport status um you know that's something that's been brought in and brought in i think as nigel you know has put so very clearly it's been one of the developments of the last 20 odd, odd years, the idea that the border is now in the A&E department or is now in the doctor's surgery. It's now when you try to get housing. And, you know, for a long time, if you were in this country, you did have rights to quite a lot of things simply by being here. And I think that's, you know, one of the really big shifts and the way that we've had this internalization of the borders, I think has been very, it's been piecemeal, it's been insidious, like a lot of the privatizations that have happened of housing, but also of functions of the state, like, um, you know, Sir, Serco, you know, Group 4, all of these big, private companies and I think again it's it's about this shift for us not being citizens to being con, con, consumers and I think we need to sort of think around though the sort of the shifting boundaries that we're existing within and it's not as simple as simply being citizens sorry I went on a bit there I do that um thanks thank you that's brilliant um I think I've just another short thing for um James's question about histories of vagrancy is just to uh, do a plug for a future follow-up event we're going to do for this Homes Not Borders um me and Kate and some other folks from History Acts are working on a follow-up event which is going to be looking more specific like or more widely at, at this kind of topic uh, in a more explicitly like colonial and global frame so in this we're going to be thinking about you know how vagrancy laws which are obviously very relevant to the work that uh, Benjamin and folks are doing at the Public Interest Law Centre how vagrancy laws were you know exported or have have formed um, colonial law in lots of different places across the world um, in lots of ways British colonial vagrancy laws are um, kind of the bedrock of what became the apartheid state in South Africa and in other places in Southern Africa. Um, and we'll obviously be looking at how um, that connects to the 1824 vagrancy law, which became the Sus laws, which was used um, 
uh, to by police to terrorize and, and harm lots of black people um, in that period of history as well and, and, and to now. Um, so we'll be picking up on those sorts of that kind of intimate connection between deportation and eviction in a, in, as colonial uh, tools of control in a later event that we'll be putting together um, after we've shaped up from what everyone's talking about from this one as well. Um, so we have another question um, from um, a historian called uh, Freya Marshall. Um, and Freya would love to hear respondents' thoughts on how gender might or might not structure people's experiences of uh, housing insecurity. Um, Aga mentioned that mothers without homes face a difficulty on the level of their motherly role towards their children. Um, and um, yeah, Freya would love to hear some more about how statutory provision hides much of women's homelessness and in fact only really draws attention to women with children while at the same time women who are in danger of deportation are particularly hidden from these histories. Aga, will you, would you be up for taking that, um, that question at all or anyone else want to think about gender in relation to who gets hidden from histories of homelessness and deportation? Sorry, I kind of, <laughs> I wasn't fully, uh, mm, I'm not able to jump in <laughs> because I kind of lost the track a little bit. I was thinking about uh, some other issues, but uh, about gender, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I will not try to just jump in, but as I mentioned in my little, um, kind of story, uh, I just realized how certain people are like m more, um, um, yes, single mothers in general is, is not a topic that is um, anywhere, you know, discussed and the support for this kind of uh, minority is, 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 is totally overlooked. So they are in this kind of whole problem the smaller problems and uh, that we kind of never go that deep and that, that that's it I kind of just wanted to add that that it hits often people who not are not very much named among the others um I, I can jump in I wouldn't necessarily um have all the answers but what I'm drawn to in thinking about that situation um, because you know my mum has children and I'm one of those kids um, but why I've said it like that is because I mean it potentially might even connect back to this idea of the sort of good citizen and this um, sort of perception of gender roles and what it means for a woman to be a good citizen potentially would also translate to becoming a mother and you know what I mean if you're a woman that doesn't have a baby then are you really a good citizen is potentially the, the kind of sort of perception that is um, being projected. Um, and what's interesting about that is what you, what ends up happening as a sort of woman that's uh, out of housing is you then pursue um, a child in order for you to be able to sort of secure safety for yourself. Um, I know this because, you know, my, my mom kind of sort of growing up in this, um, in this nation, resorted to having more kids as a way to sort of push her name up in the sort of social housing list. Um, and I know at one point, like it was myself and my older brother and uh, kids that she kind of had before. Um, but we were existing in a small room, um, just kind of sleeping in that small room, all of us sharing. Um, and ultimately she had, um, she had her name on a sort of social housing list as a way to kind of get us out of this small house but they didn't seem to take note until you had a small baby. So there's something about not just being a mother, but also having a small um, young child, which kind of projects you on that list of being able to actually acquire absolute safety. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is it kind of potentially connects to this idea of the sort of prescribed good citizen, which seems to kind of take a life of its own. Um, and what you end up having is uh, not only may you exist as this person that's constantly trying to sort of chase this idea of becoming a good citizen, but you have to then figure out what 
boxes do you need to tick? And unfortunately, it seems like in the case of the woman that is kind of suffering through a, a lack of uh, or even insecure housing, it seems like ticking those boxes involves having a child and a young child to be specific. Great, amazing, Tosin. And um, Amy, would you be able to say something about the role women or gender played in uh, the sanctuary movements of the of the eighties, as as it comes up in your research? Yeah. Um, so there was there was women, and because uh, uh, the thing is, in the eighties, we also had this big emphasis on such a sort of family. So that was a interesting discord. Um, but but what family classifies as family? Um, so a, a big part of the anti-deportation campaigns was trying to use that against the government, and and, and sometimes it worked. Um, but it also it did sometimes mean that you you did have sort of asylum seekers and people being had to sort of present themselves as these needy mothers, which are victimising in themselves as well. Um, but there was also a lot going on with the laws in that the, the, there was certain situations, I'm not quite sure when it changed, apologies, but you could be, for example, if you came over and you were um, a dependent, so you were married to somebody, and then you were in an abusive relationship, um, if you then chose to leave your husband, you were then at risk of deportation. Um, so you were you either had to stay in an abusive relationship and stay in this country um, or get deported. So there's a lot of cases like that. And sometimes they did win, but it was similarly, it was um, tends to be the cases with a baby that really shook people more and, and got those sort of headlines. And um, sort of single women more, I, I feel like, got overlooked a bit, I'd say, is my general impression. Thanks, Amy. So we're just um, coming on to um, coming on to just doing some final reflections, starting to do some final reflections from um, and questions. So we're going to start in reverse. Um, so we're going to start with um, Joel and Savan, um, just, yeah, any last questions for other panels or reflections on the event or unanswered questions, new lines of thought? I'll pass over to Savan and Joel. Do you want to go, Savan the Schlager? I don't know. Okay, I'll go first. Um, no, thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, it's just been really interesting, um, really great. I guess what Amy was just saying there and what Nigel said as well, and. And, and, and what Tossin was saying made me think that another thing that we've seen in some of the kind of 80s, 90s campaigns was this kind of the centrality of like a, a named person or a family. And I think that's a really interesting um, tactic that was used a lot, um, seemingly in the sanctuary stuff, which I don't know much about, but definitely in the like Asian youth movement. And um, we, we hosted a guy called Mohammed Idrish, um, who Nigel probably remembers, um, other people might remember him, who fought his own deportation order through a trade union. Um, which is a really inspiring sort of story from the late 80s um, and then went on to kind of be a key figure in the um, West Midlands anti-deportation group. So there's these kind of, there, we are getting, I think a lot of the groups working today like do get a lot of kind of inspiration from them, but tactically it does just feel like a very different world in terms of people are very, for all kinds of understandable reasons, don't want to put themselves front and centre. I mean, this is something we're doing with the hotels at the moment. People are deeply, deeply scared of like, in any way being kind of made unanonymous um, through campaigning, which is obviously we're totally um, understand and want to build trust around. But yeah, I'd be interested to know if people kind of could think about ways we could shift some of the tactics and solidarity practices that, um, that, that like learn from that without like exposing people really to this particularly kind of punitive racist state that is like, that does target people if they speak out. Um, but yeah, Savant, do you want to respond? No, I think you you just you just said well there. I mean, just to add, that, I would say uh, it's it's Tosin's plan, you know, to expose a, a story like having a character and you know sharing the story through a character uh, rather than the 
the person themselves who will, will, will help a lot. So, well, and the rest of the thing, you just done it well. I thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. 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 Thank you, J
Um, and I mean, I think we kind of stepped into the whole filmmaking process a bit naively in that we kind of created it, put a lot of energy into it. And now we're in a space where we're trying to figure out how best to distribute it. Um, so as kind of good as that whole experience is, we're at a bit of a, a bit of a still point trying to figure out how to continue and move forward. Um, so this has kind of been part of that um, and kind of engaging with you guys has been really amazing. Um, and I don't actually expect to leave this as is. And although I've kind of come in as a sort of PAR or LRU or hostile housing representative, um, there are also different things that I've been doing in the background. Um, and yeah, I've, I've mentioned this to Fia because I think it'd be really amazing to actually get uh, some people involved um, in this sort of photography project that I've been working on. And I think there could be a potential way of also working together in the future. <laughs> I just kind of, um, since I, I was thrown in this uh, question, I just realized really um, about gender, how um, kind of un, uh, unspoken, like not much is uh, uh, support we see towards like um, specifically single moms and the fact that, um, you know, um, often it's on them to, to, to bring up a chi ch child or children. And it seems like we keep quiet like, uh, about the stories. And I, I really, one thing to, that leaves me with is to say that uh, no child should be growing up in insecure housing situation because that's basically destroying the whole next generation. So. I'm advocating for um, to kind of speak out more about that um, particular um, issue of 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 a child and of of their situation, which is nowadays very often uh, being raised by single mom. So that's from my part. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Becky, could we hear a few concluding comments from you as well, please? Uh, sorry, I'm just going to be a bit of a history nerd here because I just got really interested by um, Joel talking about the sort of the shift, the shifting definition of adequate accommodation. Um, and I was just like, oh, I want to do some more research on that <laughs> um, because I think it's, in you know, we see the, sh um, you know, the Home Office endlessly moves its boundaries councils have endlessly moved their boundaries over what's seen as being adequate accommodation and what's you know what counts as overcrowding and I think we haven't got an adequate history of that and I got quite excited by that so <laughs> sorry <laughs> so thank you thank you um that's given me something new to think about which is always I mean as well as it's great hearing all the stories but my nerdy history head has gone oh that's exciting <laughs> um and uh thanks becky and amy any concluding comments from you at all oh, yeah i'd just like to know that thank you everything has been really lovely to hear and quite inspiring um i guess the thing that kept coming up um that i was thinking about was this idea of whether it's it's, it's useful still to to be talking about um the history of empire and 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 there's a question in the group chat about whether it's useful to uh, talk about Europeans as migrants and um and I agree with with Nigel said that there does seem to be this sort of um disconnect between people who who understand that history and people who maybe understand it or don't care I think it's it's some people are almost turned off by that history now and they kind of go well that's not to do with me that's in the past blah, blah, blah. and that kind of kind of makes it feel like it's not a worthwhile approach but i think you only need to look at things like remembrance day and things like that to see how powerful a history myth or you know narrative can be so i think maybe that's a good way of sort of thinking well actually you know it is still important that we do counter that 
um, and, and, and add other narratives to it. So yes, it's, it's, it's a bit um, depressing, but maybe there is some hope in the power of that as well. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm just going to invite Sue to say a quick uh, something about the tactic and our PF trainings that um, tactic does. Just... Uh, thanks. Thanks for you. Sorry, I didn't type quickly enough or unmute myself before. And just to thanks uh, just for being here. I, Amy, I was actually at Gatwick Airport when Viraj Mendes was deported. So I've lived a bit of the history that you've been talking about. And as I'm a Brummy, Mohammed Idris was very much a campaign that was going on at the time. It's a pity trade unions aren't a bit more active than they were. Just a tactic was set up six months ago, particularly to support people seeking asylum and undocumented. So it aims to be strategic to assist that those particular groups of people. There is training that's coming up on no recourse to public funds. It's the third time I'll have run this because of the interest in it and it does look at some of the history particularly post second world war I think I'm a lawyer who wants to be a, an actual historian I don't know um, but I, 10th, 10th, of, 10th of February is the next training and if you want to know what it's about uh, and it's certainly free to undocumented people and to people seeking asylum um, just email me at sue at tactic.org.uk uh, and I'll send you the details and join us if you can so thanks Fee. Uh, amazing. Thanks, Sue. I can't recommend uh, tactics trainings enough. That's actually where we uh, got thinking about the history of this and I found out about the uh, new immigration rule um, about rough sleepers. So um, just to start summing up, um, yeah, this has been like really amazing. Thank you so much to all of our panellists. Um, so many new questions and like things I want to start exploring and with lots of you as well. Um, I just wanted to pick up, I just wanted to say that actually we've been thinking at History Acts, we've been thinking about this event as just the first step in a bit of a project looking at this. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to be doing uh, another event uh, on the same topic, but uh, in a wider global frame. Um, but we're also hoping that this event will kind of start the conversation and we're also going to be starting to put together like a little zine or a booklet of resources to kind of help uh, piece together some of the different histories we've been hearing about today, which can go out to lots of the different groups. We've got lots of history students and history heads here as well. We've got lots of different groups from different housing campaigns and migrant uh, rights campaigns here as well. So I hope to keep us all in the conversation and also really be returning to that thing that Benjamin had said about um, that 2017 legal challenge coming from an activist place um, and now um, the work that PILC are doing doesn't have that. And he was asking about what that, what that was like. So it would be great to keep in touch with lots of people, uh, to follow up with lots of different people um, uh, and hear more about different kinds of uh, messaging and timelines that people want in that scene um, and interview more of you um, about that kind of stuff. Um, and so just to finish off, just wanna say again, thank you to everyone. Um, we're gonna, there'll be a write up soon and, um, and a recording. Um, and just to say that we are very happy to announce our next event, which is gonna be on the 11th of February, 6.30 to 8.30. Um, and that event is all about um, LGBTQIA uh, resistance in the pandemic. Um, so particularly looking at lockdown and we're gonna be having activists from the outside project, which is a LGBT plus queer homelessness project, um, as well as Bent Bars, which are um, an abolitionist um, prisoner support group for uh, trans and queer uh, prisoners in the UK. Um, and we're gonna be joined by um, historians from the pandemic, uh, a new pandemic uh, queer oral history project um, and another historian as well. So we'll be putting up the publicity about that very soon. And I hope that lots of you will return to continue that conversation as well. Um, okay, thank you so much for, for tonight and um, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everybody.